Hey, it's good to have you here. Come on in, have a seat. Welcome to the Beyond Picket Fences podcast. We are your hosts, Mandy Benicky and Naomi Marquez. And signing up for just a few dollars each month, you can help support this podcast so we can keep this platform to give people just like you a chance to share their stories. We believe there's so much power and support in storytelling, and we'd love to be able to continue this indefinitely. But podcasting isn't free. With just a few dollars each month, you can help this podcast thrive. Okay, that's enough of me talking. Now let's get on with the show. First, each month, you can help support this podcast so we can keep this platform to give people just like you a chance to share their stories. We believe there's so much power and support in storytelling, and we'd love to be able to continue this indefinitely. But podcasting isn't free. With just a few dollars each month, you can help this podcast thrive. Okay, that's enough of me talking. Now let's get on with the show. Dr. Danica Hubbard has taught for over 25 years as an English professor at a community college located in the Chicago suburbs. As an author, she has been featured in local magazines and newspapers, presented at several universities, national conferences, and interviewed on multiple podcasts, focusing on how she turned her pain into positivity. Her book, Sex Offender, My Father's Secrets, My Secret Shame, reflects on the relationship with her father while he was incarcerated and died in a maximum security prison hospice. As a victim of sexual abuse herself, Dr. Hubbard is interested in continuing a safe and sensitive dialogue to hopefully begin a process of healing. A portion of each book sale is donated to the organization Prevent Child Abuse America. Her book is available for purchase on Amazon in paperback and download on Kindle. Please welcome Dr. Danica Hubbard. My father, my my hero, I was an only child, and he was a positive force in my life as a provider for our family and an advice giver, an entertainer, a, a secure place to, to go in, in a storm. And that whole perception of my father was inverted and turned upside down when he held his hand, held his head in his hands and knelt down in front of me on a weekend, it was an afternoon, and shared that he made some horrible decisions and that he violated an innocent young girl. Mm. And you can imagine I was confused, upset, repulsed. I felt sick to my stomach. It was like seeing someone for the first time. I had only known my father for 32 years as my dad. Mm -hmm. And when those words came out of his mouth, it was like I had an out-of-body experience. I just couldn't believe what was happening. It was surreal. I felt blindsided. I I immediately was like rewinding my life in my mind in terms of did I, were there signals or signposts or moments where I could have found out that he was violating. I I don't know. I, I I've only known my father is this this one person, even though obviously he were he was multiple people, but that's that's the during. So that began when he was in his 60s. And like I said, I was 32 years old. I had a child of my own who happened to be napping upstairs when my dad told me this information and admitted of one sexual crime. And I was pregnant with my second daughter. So it was just such a jarring Mm. admission Mm. of, of guilt on his part. So that began. And I think the one of the most important things in writing this book about being the daughter of a sex offender is it's very specific to what happened in my life with my relationship 
and focusing on my father's incarceration. And it's really my goal to make sure that there were so many entry points in this book, so many chapters where an audience member, a person, or reader could pick it up and read a chapter and put it back down. It's definitely not a beach read. It's not an easy book to read. It it obviously can trigger a very visceral reaction for victims of sexual abuse. And I, again, am very respectful and cognizant of that. I did not know all of my father's victims. There's no way of knowing all of my father's victims. Mm -hmm. In researching for the book, I was able to find and unfortunately discover some of his victims, but I don't know all of them. So the book is really a hybrid that balances academic research. I'm an English professor. I teach composition and I constantly tell my students to find their voice and to share their voice with others without shaking. And this was one of those pivotal times in my life where I was listening to my own lessons when I was listening to my own college lectures saying, find your voice without shaking, write this book and put it into a body of literature that is basically non-existent for families or friends or coworkers or community members who know a sex offender. Mm -hmm. There is a robust amount of literature for victims of sexual crimes, as there should be. But this was something very different. So my approach was obviously very different. And to be clear, I, I don't think it serves any of us that I should write a book that spotlights voyeurism. It certainly was a very, very difficult book for me to write, And it does not recount each and every one of my father's victims' experiences. I was unable to to find all of his victims. He, He died before this book was published. So the horrifying details of his intent and his criminal actions are there, but I, but aren't fully there. And I was informed by a few of his victims who he ultimately hurt and destroyed. But again, I have no idea the carnage and the shrapnel that is still inside those victims that he touched that are walking around today. My hope is that in opening the conversation on your podcast and in speaking to several universities with audiences of future criminal justice students, DCFS employees, social workers, home health aides, people who work with rape victims, that this conversation can continue with respect and integrity. And as his family member, it's very difficult to say the word sex offender in association with my father. So he he was convicted. He admitted to one of the crimes and he was he pled guilty in the year 2000 to two counts of felony degree sexual assault of a child. He went to jail. He eventually went to prison in the state of Wisconsin. He was at Fox Lake Correctional Institution. And the judge imposed a 30-year sentence. So he died in prison. He died while incarcerated when he was 77 years old. He was never coming out of prison. He would have been over 100 years old. Mm -hmm. And I truly believe that prison is where he should have been based on what I know now, based on the research that I've done for this book and speaking to attorneys in speaking to therapists, and in speaking to some of his victims. So in that during, when I was a young professional, when I was a full-time professor and a young mother and a wife of two children, I had a father who was in prison. 
And my reaction to that crime, which is abhorrent, was really difficult physically, emotionally, and psychologically. I struggled mightily with, do I continue a relationship with my father? Because again, I was 32 years old when I found out. It's very difficult to flip a switch off of a parent. And Mm -hmm. I, I I struggled with my feelings of abandonment, of deception, of lying, no doubt he 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 lied to to me to his coworkers to his community to his church and there was so much anger to process so much sadness so much detachment in that during and i really had to dig deep and answer my own questions do i continue to communicate with this man Do I cut ties off? Because generally speaking, that's the reaction. Lock them up and throw away the key. Mm -hmm. Why would you ever talk to someone like that again? He's a monster. Mm -hmm. He doesn't deserve your communication. He doesn't deserve a letter. He certainly doesn't deserve a visit in prison. But the paradox for me was he was still my father. Mm -hmm. He still had a beating heart. I am not apologizing for his criminal acts. I don't support it in any way, shape or form. But how do you come to terms with that as a daughter of a sex offender? I had some pretty important decisions to make. So with, a lot of processing and tears and confusion and anger. I decided to write my father letters. He never called our house during the times when obviously our daughters were growing up. We decided to put up a boundary there, but I did have letters exchanged with him, which I highlight some of the excerpts in the book. I exchanged over 500 letters with my father while he was incarcerated for a 17-year period. And I was really trying through those letters of communication and through the visits, I would say on a seasonal basis, because we were out of state. It took us about five hours to travel to the prison. So it was quite arduous to go visit him, as it is for many families who visit incarcerated loved ones or incarcerated persons. And I was trying to find an outlet to process that pain and that trauma. And I think that comes in several different forms. I numbed myself by being busy. That was my favorite thing to do. Mm So I joined committees at work. I became a U.S. Fulbright scholar. I taught in Croatia. I taught at Xi'an University in China. I published articles, I was on panels and workshops, I became a Girl Scout leader, I was a a community member, a civil servant, anything that I could do to schedule my days and weekends and hours not to think about my father being in prison, I did it. And The same was true during the 17 year period for my daughters because they're my whole world and I'm very protective and I was so hyper aware of the dangers that are out there as a parent, but even more aware because my father was incarcerated as a sex offender. Mm -hmm. So I scheduled them as much as I scheduled myself. They were in dance and lacrosse and soccer. And they, I signed them up to learn competitive chess. I mean, it just, it went on. And those were my coping mechanisms for myself and for my family. I have to say my husband is an anchor and continues to be throughout this time. He did go accompany me to visit my father, and I am so grateful for that. 
I did not share with my daughters that my father was incarcerated. They had no idea. So again, reflecting on this during part, I felt my father deceived me by lying and deceived so many others, of course. But in turn, I felt I was lying to my daughters by not telling them that their grandfather was a, a felon. Mm-hmm. But I, I, we made the choice not to do that. And that's not a choice every family makes. Because when I visited my father in prison, there were plenty of families with toddlers and adolescents and others within that visiting area. So that's not a choice that everyone makes, but it's a choice that we made. And I stand behind that choice. I'm glad we made that choice. Shortly before my father died of acute myeloid leukemia, he died when he was 77 years old. He was handcuffed to the hospital bed. My daughter found a letter from the prison. And if you've had any communication or experience in fielding communication with someone from a prison, it's pretty clear that that communication is coming from an incarcerated person. There is usually a big stamp on the letter, or if you receive a phone call, there's always a pre-recorded message, message prior to speaking to that person that this call is coming from a state prison, a federal prison, a jail. So when my daughter picked up that letter with the big stamp saying this came from Fox Lake Correctional Institution, that was very difficult because we hadn't shared that with her or our younger daughter. How old was your daughter at the time? She was graduating high school. Okay. So an adult. Uh, and sometimes people ask, well, were you ever going to tell her? And now obviously she knows. <laughs> she read the book. We've had several conversations. I really did that out of a cloak of fierce protection for our daughters and trying to unpack and explain his crimes. I, I felt were not my place to do but I didn't want to connect him with them either. So they never knew their grandfather. Now they know that he spent 17 years in prison, but those were their formative years. Mm -hmm. So whenever we visited the prison, which again took all day, right? Five hours there, five hours back, and usually a three hour visit, we made up a story. And thankfully we had family who knew he was in prison that took care of them during that time. But I felt so guilty for making up those stories. So ashamed. And I didn't do the crime. Mm -hmm. So I think writing and talking with you on the podcast and, and informing and sharing my story with your audience can hopefully cross this threshold where people might feel alone or ashamed or unsafe about something that has happened to them or a loved one and are able to come forward and use their voice. Because I think that the more I talk about my father's sexual abuse crimes, his criminal acts, the more I recognize this idea between reality and escapism. And when I was busying myself and numbing myself and trying to forget that my father was a felon in prison, I just wasn't there yet. I just wasn't ready to accept that reality and talk about it at a Girl Scout meeting <laughs> or a coffee or walking my kids to school. It's just not something that is shareable easily. Mm -hmm. And Brene Brown talks about this idea of shame, right? And, and I carried that reference of, of shame throughout my, my father's incarceration. And now that he is deceased, I felt like it was an important time to 
lend my voice to the conversation and again, heighten this type of awareness. I, when I was writing the book, I came across an organization, a nonprofit called Prevent Child Abuse America. And I have gone to their national conference. I have spoken at their regional conference, again, to nurses, social workers, a variety of people in the field. And a portion of the proceeds of the sales of my book are donated to Prevent Child Abuse America. I just presented them with a check in August, actually, from uh, the first year sales of my book. That's amazing. Thank you. So in doing so, I I hope that can move the conversation forward and and, and continue this delicate discussion. I also started volunteering with a group called Prison Families Alliance, and I facilitate, I'm on the board, and I also facilitated different conversations over Zoom with a variety of people from across the country, former sex offenders families of sex offenders, attorneys of sex offenders, and again, people in the allied health field. And that was really illuminating and still is to work with Prison Families Alliance. Again, I'm aware that I am not alone as as a daughter of a sex offender, and there are mothers of sex offenders and wives of sex offenders and husbands of sex offenders who contact me via email or on Facebook or on my publisher's website and share their stories. And it is heartbreaking and embarrassing and humiliating. And again, these are the people that didn't didn't commit the crime, but their loved ones are. And how do you come to terms with that? So to me, it's this continued exercise in trust, and I've had some struggles with trust based on knowing my father a certain way for 32 years and Mm -hmm. then um, him acquiescing, sharing a half-truth about a little girl that he touched inappropriately and just turning my world upside down. So since that point... I question myself, who do I have confidence in? Who can I rely upon? Who do I believe? Because I really relied upon my parent, my father, especially as an only child. So coming to terms with the truth of it, the reality of it, is a really difficult threshold to to cross. So just continuing in the during, Mm. I often wanted to hide kind of make myself small, become absent even. I I would say that I would go somewhere with a friend and then cancel at the last minute because the background noise, the, the music bed of my life, if you will, was my father's incarceration. But again, I felt, I felt trapped and muted. I, I couldn't really talk about it. And 20 years ago, when my father went to prison, there weren't virtual online meetings in organizations like Prison Families Alliance that I knew of. You know, Zoom was not in existence. And I was really afraid to use the internet because my father's crime was already all over the internet. If you were to use a search engine and put his his name in, you would find out not only his crimes, but where he went and where he lived and where he was registered and where he got caught again, uh, because there's the rate of recidivism, you know, with, with this type of crime and others. So I just, again, did not want to face that re- reality during the during of having a relationship with my father. So my version of navigating a social situation when someone asked me about my dad, which is a pretty typical question you would ask at any benchmark, any typical holiday, Hallmark holiday or otherwise, what are you doing for mm-hmm. Father's Day? Or mm-hmm. are your grandparents, so the grandparents of the girls going to come to the dance recital? Mm-hmm. Or are you going to come with us? We're all going out to brunch. It's, 
my mother died of cancer when she was 49 years old. And I had no problem confiding in people, finding sources, reaching out about my mother dying of a physical disease. But when my father was in prison, I felt like he had died, yet he was still living. And this is called outcarceration, not incarceration. So our outcarcerated people and Julie Lazaric, Julia Lazaric, who wrote Prison, the Hidden Sentence, another wonderful resource if you're interested. And she's also on the Prison Families Alliance board with me as well. She talks about this outcarceration for families of incarcerated loved ones and what that means to move around in the world. So to me, when someone was asking about Father's Day or holidays, like I had mentioned earlier, I would tell a half truth or a lie. Oh, my dad is busy. He can't make it. I would come up with some sort of survival strategy to try to get out of answering that question. And this deception ultimately created this false representation of who I really was. I was really hurting. I was really lost. I really wanted to talk to someone about it. But I made up a story instead because it was too humiliating and embarrassing to talk about for me. Laced with anger and frustration, of course. So not only was I unable to respond to people, but I also kind of created this, what I call like a great Gatsby world, which I'm an English professor. If you don't know great Gatsby, that's Scott Fitzgerald, the novel that he wrote a long time ago. And in the great Gatsby world, everything is, is shiny and polished and clean and fun and entertaining. So we would host a lot of dinner parties And we would have extravagant cookies and cocktails, right? So people would bring cookies and we would make all sorts of uh, different holiday drinks. And it was so much fun, right? So I would, again, produce this exterior of everything is fine. It's all great. It's all sunshine and rainbows and unicorns over here. Nothing is wrong. But if you start to peel back that exterior and really delve deep into the root of trauma, you would find a very broken, sad, ashamed person, someone who can't talk about her father in a, quote, normal way, whatever that normal way is. So in those connections with people, I would ask myself, do I deserve happiness Uh, Do I deserve to achieve accolades in my career or as a mom when my dad is in prison? I mean, why would anyone think that way? But I did. I had such a sense of guilt on the holidays when I was eating slices of turkey and mounds of mashed potatoes and pumpkin pie. I would think about my dad. What is my dad eating in prison? Do they even get a slice of pumpkin pie? Do they deserve a slice of pumpkin pie? Probably not. Not for what he did. But he was still living. So that was constantly in my mind while he was in prison. Pushing him away and then pulling myself back in. So it was pretty cyclical. And those connections with other people where I find joy because I don't have siblings were just like this reality versus fantasy, right? Because people would describe me as a very buoyant person. You're so positive. You're so sunny side up. You're always smiling, but they really didn't know what was going on underneath. And I think it's critical to share the universal suffering that we can feel. It's okay to say, listen, this is happening and I'm going to trust you and I'm going to share it with you. And I just feel awful about it. And I don't know what to do about it. 
So what do you, you know, how do you move around in the world when your father's a sexual predator, right? What do you do with that information? So I told you about the great Gatsby and numbing myself with being busy. And then again, being an educator, a researcher, I dove a lot into literature. And so I was trying to get a definition of terms, right? Not to dismiss or water down what my father did, but just for my own information, peace of mind, context. So I found out, okay, there's all these interchangeable words that people will use with the term sex offender, like pedophile and child molester and other words that I'm not going to repeat on this podcast. But there, there is literature behind this that, that defines this choice of terminology. So pedophile is a clinical term. Sex offender is a legal term. You can't be convicted as a pedophile, as you know, in terms of pedophilia, but you can be convicted of a sex offense. So there's really no such thing as a, in terms of a definition of terms as a convicted pedophile. So again, the nuance between those terms, I think, was really important to me because when I was researching and looking into newspapers and articles and books, I came up and brushed up, brushed against a lot of popular media. You know, the media will use the word sex offense, right? When talking about people like the USA gymnastics doctor, Larry Nassar, mm. or the Hollywood film actor, Chris Norris, or the anchor, Matt Lauer, right? Mm -hmm. So there's this umbrella term that they use. And sometimes victims of sex offense, offenses, including myself, mm -hmm. will be pretty repulsed and frustrated by that uh, because it doesn't, I, I think, speak to the gravity of, of what happened, um, of, what, of what those um, people were accused of doing. So I think that the definition of terms is, is important. And again, getting back to pedophilia, which is someone who's sexually attracted to prepubescent children, pedophile is classified as a mental disorder. It's, it's in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. It's a DSM-5, right? It's, it's highlighted there in great depth with bullet points regarding what that is. So I think that the definition of terms is really important. A sex offender is someone on the sex offender registry. Every state has one. I urge people listening to this podcast to get on a search engine and look up the sex offender registry in your neighborhood, in your community, by your school, because every sex offender has a list, a myriad of things that they are not allowed to do. Live within proximity of a school. Live in close proximity of a shopping mall. Even my father did not have a dog, an animal, to walk around the neighborhood because grooming will occur, right? They'll interact. So their world should be very small, but I think that knowing who's in your neighborhood is really, really important in identifying a, a sex offender on the registry. And then finally, just the, those definitions of terms, a child molester is somebody who molests children, someone who engages in sexual misconduct with a child. So again, very nuanced, but I think important when we're talking about sex offenders, which is the the, the legal term when you are convicted and charged with that offense. Some states even have tiers of sex offenses, tier one, tier two, tier three. And then your, your sentence, your conviction is associated with those tiers. So all that information is public. And again, I think for the safety of, of children, of adolescents, of, of do no harm, I, I think it's our responsibility to know what's going on in our neighborhoods. So that's really the, the during in terms of, of busying myself and, and those connections to try to find joy. 
I think that I'll, I'll, I'll save for the next installment or the next podcast what happened after my father died, because that was, again, a whole new idea of now having a spotlight on the truth and something I couldn't really step out of. So his funeral mass, his obituary, all the things that happen with it, the bereavement of a death were so different for me than it was, for example, for my mother. And I'll, I guess I'll save that for the next, the after, after he died, because I'll, I'll never forget that phone call from the prison, letting me know that he, he had died and, and to quickly make arrangements, he had um, willed that he would be cremated. So just getting that process in motion was so different than when my mother had died. Danica, thank you so much for sharing your story. I have to tell you that you've you've really taken the time to go through and really pull apart, peel the onion of what it looked like to be a daughter of a sex offender. And I am the sister of a sex offender. And what I appreciate is your statement that said, critical to share the universal suffering. Through my experience, I have found in within the family, they don't want to talk about it. And I do have siblings, cousins, aunts and uncles. And my grandfather was a sex offender. And it has, it has been something that since it happened that I've worked towards sharing it and speaking openly about what has happened in our family, not about the victims and who the victims are, but the perpetrator themselves. And where I have struggled is because generationally it's happened in our family. What if one day I wake up and I'm a child molester, right? And I, you know, wake up with those desires and I've gone to therapy and have worked through it. I've, Mandy and I, we were actually talking about it this morning on our walk. And it's a real fear. You just, you know, you, you don't know where that comes from and when it comes about until you start talking about it and you start um, being able to express your fears about your connection with that kind of desire. When did you start therapy or did you? I did. When my father told me, like I said, I was 32 years old. And back then, this was over 20 years ago, I had health insurance, thankfully. And part of my health insurance was covered for mental health, thankfully. But finding a therapist was a mountain to climb for several reasons. I had not been to therapy before. I was a little reluctant, like I said earlier, to, to share that my father was a sex offender. He was already incarcerated, but I wasn't a victim of him. I was a secondary victim. He certainly affected me in many different ways, but I wasn't his victim in terms of, of touching. Mm -hmm. So when I met with a therapist, I think immediately there was confusion because she kept referring to me as the victim of my father and would press and ask about the many different ways that he violated me sexually. And I kept trying to return and recurse and go back to, he never touched me, but he is incarcerated for a sex offense of children he did touch. So that relationship um, went on for a few sessions. And I think the therapist was well-versed in the direct victims of sexual abuse, but not at all all knowledgeable in how to open the line of communication and become potentially a, 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 a touchstone or, or healing solve for someone who was a daughter of a sex offender. And like you said, Naomi, to, to share in that, I'm, is this going to happen to me? Is this genetic? Is this... Mm -hmm contagious. I know that sounds ridiculous. But, but you think like that. I mean, the fear, it's like, this is somebody I loved. 
Mm-hmm. Like how well, like and we other, share DNA. Other neurological disorders are genetic. So why wouldn't you think that? Exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And I kept shifting again in this detachment, this this desperate need for absenteeism and escapism, thinking to myself, fantasizing to myself, what if it really wasn't? Or maybe he could have committed another crime, like he could have been a drug dealer or a bank robber or a murderer, but not a sex offender. That is the most heinous crime. How could he be a sex offender? So again, I was I was trying to not necessarily come to terms with that. I don't think I've ever come to terms with that as, as that crime is associated with my father. But how do I learn from it? And how do I present myself? And that was the type of therapeutic conversation I was yearning for, I was desiring, I was looking for, I was desperate for, but it did not happen. I think now there are groups that I mentioned earlier, Prison Families Alliance is one of them. I work also with the Prison Education Project with inmates both nationally and internationally. And those topics come up about family, about friends, about community. That line of communication is much more open than it was 20 years ago. We just for our audience to know, we are going to wrap up this episode here in the next minute or so. And then we are going to have episode two Mm -hmm. next week. So want everybody to stay tuned. Um, Danica, if they want to reach out to you or have access to your book, would you give them that information real quick? Absolutely. Uh, My book is called Sex Offender, My Father's Secrets, My Secret Shame. And it is available on Amazon in a paperback copy and also downloadable on a Kindle. Fantastic. And if anybody's interested in having you speak at their at an institution that they're a part of and or work, where do they reach out to you at? Oh, great question. I'm available through email. You can email me at Hubbard, which is my last name, H-U-B-B-A-R-D, at C-O-D. Dot edu. Fantastic. Thank you, Danica. Mm-hmm. Thanks so much for sharing today. You're Thank welcome. you for sharing. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Like he could have been a drug dealer or a bank robber or a murderer, but not a sex offender. That is the most heinous crime. How could he be a sex offender? So again, I was I was trying to not necessarily come to terms with that. I don't think I've ever come to terms with that as as that crime is associated with my father. But how do I learn from it? And how do I present myself? And that was the type of therapeutic conversation I was yearning for, I was desiring, I was looking for, I was desperate for. But it did not happen. I think now there are groups that I mentioned earlier, Prison Families Alliance is one of them. I work also with the Prison Education Project with inmates both nationally and internationally. And those topics come up about family, about friends, about community. That line of communication is much more open than it was 20 years ago. We just for our audience to know, we are going to wrap up this episode here in the next minute or so. And then we are going to have episode two mm-hmm. next week. So want everybody to stay tuned. Um, Danica, if they want to reach out to you or have access to your book, would you give them that information real quick? Absolutely. Uh, my book is called Sex Offender, My Father's Secrets, My Secret Shame. And it is available on Amazon in a paperback copy and also downloadable on a Kindle. Fantastic. And if anybody's interested in having you speak at their at an institution that they're a part of and or work, where do they reach out to you at? Oh, great question. I'm available through email. You can email me at Hubbard, which is my last name, H-U-B-B-A-R-D, at C-O-D. 
Fantastic. Thank you, Danica. Thanks so much for sharing today. Thank you for sharing. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye.